the culmination. On January 2nd, 1927, Jung had a dream set in Liverpool. I am with several young Swiss in Liverpool, down by the docks. It is a dark, rainy night with smoking clouds. We walk up to the upper part of town, which lies on a plateau. We come to a small circular lake in a centrally located gar garden. In the middle of this, there's an island. The men speak of a Swiss who live there, who lives here in such a sooty, dark, dirty city. But I can see that on the island stands a magnolia tree covered with red flowers, illuminated by an eternal sun, and think, now I know why this Swiss fellow lives here. He apparently also knows why. I see the city map. He then painted a mandala based on, upon this map. He attached great significance to this dream, later commenting, this dream is my inner situation. I still now see this yellow-gray raincoat shining with the moisture of the rain, and everything was terribly unpleasant. This is how I felt about myself, for I had the inner vision of this heavenly beauty, and thanks to that, one can live. And then I saw that is conclusive, that is the goal, Then and then I saw that is, that is conclusive, that is the goal. One cannot go above the middle. The middle is the goal and everything was directed towards this. From this I recognized that the self is an archetype of orientation and of meaning. The one Swiss is the I. He lives in one of the filthy streets in one of the car fours, in one of the carry fours. He is a small replica of the center. I know that I, I know that the I is not the center. It is not the self. But from there, I have a sight of the divine wonder. I certainly did not live there, but I lived eccentrically. The small light appeared to me as the likeness of the great light. So there was also something in the eccentric aspect which recalled the original vision for me. After this dream, I gave up painting and drawing my, or drawing mandalas, or drawing mandalas. I then understood that there was no straight line of development, but that development first led up from below onto the mountain. That is one straight line development, but if one is initially above, one sees the great expanse of the lake, the island, and the tree of light within it. This dream described the apex of the whole unconscious process of development. It completely satisfied me, since it fully expressed my situation. I was utterly lonely then. I knew that I was occupied with something quite great, but which no one understood. This clarification through the dream made it possible for me to consider objective objectively what filled me. For me the small side line the small side light was the eye. It was like a recognition of the magnificent tree in the middle. The others did not see the tree, only I saw it. It was as if the sun shone there. But it was also as if the flowers were self illuminated. It was as if this tree stood in sunlight. It was bright day there and unbelievably beautiful. Where we stood was dark, cold, and showery night. My life would have actually lost its meaning without such a vision, but the meaning was expressed here. The realization was that the self was the goal of the process of individuation. Progression was not linear, but involved the circum, circum, circumambulation of the self. This realization gave him strength, for otherwise, the whole experience would have driven me crazy, or would have driven other people crazy. He felt that the mandala drawing showed him the self in its saving function, and that this was his salvation. The task now was one of consolidating these insights into his life and science. 
In his 1926 revision of the psychology of the unconscious processes, he highlighted the significance of the midlife transition. He argued that the first half of life could be characterized as the natural phase in which the prime aim was establishing oneself in the world, earning an income and raising a family. The second half, the cultural phase, involved the reevaluation of earlier values. The goal in this period was one of conserving precious values while recognizing their opposites. This meant that individuals had to develop the underdeveloped and neglected aspects of their personality. The individuation process was now conceived as the general pattern of human development. He argued that there was a lack of guidance for this transition in contemporary society, and he saw his psychology as fulfilling this lacuna. Outside of analytical psychology, Jung's formulations had an impact on the field of adult development psychology. Clearly, his crisis experience formed the template for this conception of the tasks of the two halves of life. The Black Boots and the Novice depict his, re- depict his reappraisal of his previous values and his attempt to develop the neglected aspects of his personality. Thus, they form the basis of his understanding of how the midlife transition could be successfully navigated. In 1928, as we have seen, he published the relations between the I and the unconscious. It was a small book, expanding on his 1916 paper, The Structure of the Unconscious. Jung wrote about the interior drama of the transformation process. He enlarged upon his earlier discussions and added a section dealing in detail with the process of individuation. He noted that after one had dealt with the fantasies from the personal sphere, one met with fantasies from the impersonal sphere. These were not simply arbitrary but converged upon a goal. Hence these later fantasies could be described as processes of initiation. For this process to take place, active participation was required. When the conscious mind participates actively and experiences each stage of the process, then the next image always starts off on the higher level that has been won, and purpose, purposeness develops. After the assimilation of the personal unconscious, the differentiation of, of the persona and the overcoming of a state of god like of godlikeness the next stage was the integration of the anima for men and the animus for women jung argued that just as it was essential for a man to distinguish between what he was and how he appeared to others it was essential to become conscious of his invisible relations to the unconscious and hence to differentiate himself from the anima He noted that when the anima was unconscious, it was projected. He laid out the following sequence in the development of the anima and its relation to the man's mother. The first bearer of the soul image is always the mother. Later later it is borne by those women who arouse the man's feelings, whether in a positive or negative sense, because the mother is the first bearer of the soul soul image separation from her is a delicate and important matter of the greatest educational significance for a man the mother protects him against the dangers that threatens from the darkness of his soul subsequently the anima in the form of the mother imago is transferred to the wife his wife has to take over the magical role of the mother. Under the cloak of the ideally exclusive marriage, he is really seeking his mother's protection, and thus he plays into the hands of his wife's protective instincts. What is ultimately required is the objectification of the anima. A successful engagement and integration 
led to the overcoming of the anima as an autonomous complex and her transformation into a function of relationship between consciousness and the unconscious. Through this process, the anima forfeits the diamonic power of an autonomous complex. That means she can no longer exercise possession since she is depotentiated. To achieve this dispossession, one needed to enter into dialogue with her and pose questions through inner dialogue or active imagination. Everyone he, everyone he, exclaim, he claimed had this ability to hold dialogues with him or herself. Active imagination would thus be one form of inner dialogue, a type of dramatized thinking. It was critical to disidentify from the thoughts that arose and to overcome the assumption that one had produced them oneself. What was most essential was not interpreting or understanding the fantasies but experiencing them. This represented a shift from his paper on the transcendent function in which he had emphasized creative formulation and understanding. He argued that one should treat the fantasies completely literally while one was engaged in them, but symbolically when one interpreted them. This was a direct description of his procedure in the black books. The task of such discussions was to objectify the effects of the anima and become conscious of the underlying content while integrating these into consciousness. When one had succeeded in doing this, the anima then became a function of the relationship between consciousness and the unconscious, enabling communication between the two, as opposed to working as an autonomous complex. Again, this process of the integration of the anima was the subject of Libra Novice and the Black Books. It also highlights the fact that the fantasies here should be read symbolically and not literally. To take statements from them out of context and to cite them literally would, rep would represent a serious misunderstanding. <coughs> Jung noted that this process had three effects. The first effect is that the range of consciousness is increased by the inclusion of a great number and variety of unconscious contents. The second is a gradual diminution of the dominating influence of the unconscious. The third is an alteration in the personality after one had achieved the integration of the anima, it was confronted with another figure, namely the man of perso personality. Young argued that when the anima lost her mana or power, the man who assimilated it must have acquired this and so becomes a man of personality, a being of superior will and wisdom. However, this figure was a dominant of the collective unconscious, the recognized archetype of the powerful man in the form of hero, chief, magician, medicine man, and saint, the lord of men, and spirits, the friend of gods. And thus, in integrating the anima and attaining her power, one inevitably identified with the figure of the magician, and one faced the task of differentiating oneself from this. He added that, for women, the corresponding figure was that of the Great Mother. If one gave up the claim to, figure, to, vic to victory over the anima, possession by the figure of the magician ceased, and one realized that the man had truly belonged to the midpoint of the personality, <coughs> that is, the self. The assimilation of the contents of the man of personality led to the self. His description of the encounter with the man of personality, the identification and the subsequent disidentification with it, corresponds to his encounter with Philemon. The self 
he wrote, it might as well be called God in us. The beginnings of our whole psychic life seem to be inextricably rooted to this point, and all our highest and deepest purposes seem to be striving toward it. His description of the self conveys the significance of his realization following his Liverpool dream. The self could be characterized as a kind of compensation for the conflict between inner and outer. The self is also the goal of life because it is the most complete expression of that faithful combination we call individuality. With the experiencing of the self as something irrational, as an indefinable being to which I is neither opposed nor subjected, but in a relation of dependence and around which it revolves very much as the earth revolves around about the sun, then the goal of individuation has been reached. In the black books in the 1920s, one finds the lengthening shadows of death commencing with Jung's grief at his mother's death, followed by the premature deaths of close friends, Herman Sig in 1927 and Hans Smith in 1932, and patients George Porter and Jerome Schloss in 1927. In an entry in 1927, Jung referred to thoughts regarding the death of his wife and himself. Jung's father had died at the age of 54 in 1929. Jung himself reached this age. The proximity of mortality brought with his brought it brought with it intimations of immortality. That year, he wrote in his commentary of the secret of the golden flowers. Commentary on the secret of the golden flowers. That as a physician he attempted to strengthen the conviction of immortality especially with older patients death he argued should be seen as a goal rather than an end and he designated the latter part of life as life toward death two years later in his paper the turning point of life he elaborated on this theme characterizing the psychological transformations of the midlife transition he noted that the notion of life after death was a primordial image and that it made sense to live in accordance with this from this perspective of a doctor of souls. He argued it, it made sense to regard death as only a transition. Three years later, he wrote a paper on soul and death, characterizing religions as systems for the preparation of death for death. He argued that, given the collective soul of humanity, death might be regarded as a fulfillment of life's meaning. Belief in an afterlife in anthropologically norma normative was anthropologically normative, and it was rather secular materialism that viewed death as a pure cessation. This was an aberrant development viewed from a historical and cross-cultural perspective. The issue of death became particularly acute at midlife. From then, only those remain living who are willing to die with life, since what happens in the secret hour of the midday of life is the reversal of the parabola, the birth of death. The black books chart how Jung negotiated the reversal of the parabola seen from this perspective. His personal transformation, his individuation, was a preparation for death. <laughs>